Up and about. Rocky Islands, goes Rook. Time to be about their business. Silently, they floated in on the town, but when their icy eyes sighted the first dead fish, first bits of garbage about the ships and wharves, they began to scream and quarrel. The cocks in Boston backyard said long before cried the coming of day. Now the hens were also awake, scratching, clucking, laying eggs. Cats in malt houses, granaries, ship holds, mansions and hovels, caught a last mouse, settled down to wash their fur and sleep. Cats did not work by day. In stables, horses shook their halters and whinnied. In barns, cows lowed to be milked. Boston slowly opened its eyes, stretched, and woke. The sun struck in horizontally from the east, flashing upon weather vanes, brass cocks and arrows. Here a glass-eyed Indian, there a copper grasshopper. And the bells and the steeples cling clanged, telling the people it was time to be up and about. In hundreds of houses, sleepy women woke sleepier children. Get up and to work. Ephraim, get to the pump, fetch mother water. And get to the barn, milk the cow and drive her to the common. Start the fire, Silas. Put on a clean shirt, James. Dolly, if you aren't up before I count ten. And so crooked little house at the head of Hancock's Wharf on crowded Fish Street. Mrs. Latham stood at the foot of the ladder leading to the attic where her father-in-law's apprentices slept. These boys were luckier than most apprentices. Their master was too feeble to climb ladders. The middle-aged mistress too stout. It was only her bellows that could penetrate to their quarters, not her heavy hands. Boys? No answer. Dove? Coming, ma'am. Dove turned over for one more snooze. Frustrated, she shook the ladder. She was too heavy to climb. She wished she could shake them limbs of Satan. Dusty Miller, let me hear your voice. It is, piped Dusty pertly. Her voice chanted pleading. Johnny, you get them two lazy lugger beds up. Get them down here. You pull that worthless dove right out of her bed. You give Dusty a kick for me. I'm waiting for him to fetch fresh water so I can get on with breakfast. Johnny Tremaine was on his feet. He did not bother to answer his mistress. He turned to the fat, pale, almost white-haired boy, still wallowing in bed. Hear that, Dove? Oh, you... Leave me lay, can't you? Crumbling, he swung his legs out of the bed and the three boys shed. Johnny was already in his leather breeches, pulling on his coarse shirt, tucking in the tails. He was a rather skinny boy, neither large nor small for fourteen. He had a thin, sleek, flushed face, light eyes, a wry mouth, and fair, lank hair. Although two years younger than the swinish dove, inches shorter, pounds lighter, he knew. And old Mr. Latham knew. Busy, busy Mrs. Latham and her four daughters, and Dove and Dusty also knew that Johnny Tremaine was the boss of the attic, and almost of the house. Dusty Miller was alone. It was easy for Johnny to say, Look sharp, Dusty! Little Dusty looked sharp. But Dove, his first name had long ago been forgotten, hated the way the younger apprentice lorded over him, telling him when to go to bed and when to get up, criticizing his work in the silversmith shop as though he was already a master smith. Hadn't he been working four years for Mr. Latham and Johnny only two? Why did the boy have to be so infernally smart with his hands and his tongue? Look here, Johnny. I'm not getting up because you tell me to. I'm getting up because Mrs. Latham tells me to. All right, said Johnny blandly. Just so you're up. There's only one window in the attic. Johnny always stood before it as he dressed. He liked this view down the length of Hancock's Wharf. Counting houses, shops, stores, sail loss, and one great ship after another. Home again after their voyaging, content as cows waiting to be milked. He watched the gulls, so fierce and beautiful, fighting and screaming among the ships. Beyond the wharf was the sea and the rocky islands where gulls nested. He knew to the fraction of a moment how long it would take for the other two boys to get onto their clothes. Swinging about, he leaped through the head of the ladder, hardly looking where he went. 
One of Dub's big feet got there first. Johnny stumbled, caught himself, and swung silently about at Dub. Oh, Johnny, I'm sorry, stuttered Dub. Sorry, eh? You're gonna be a lot sorry. I just didn't notice. You do that again, and I'll beat you up. You ever gonna pick up a louse? You. He went on from there. Mr. Laffin was strict about his boy swearing, but Johnny could get along very well without it. Whatever a pig of a louse was, it did describe the whitish, flaccid, parasitic dove. Little Dusty froze as the older boys quarreled. He knew Johnny could beat up Dove any time he chose. He worshipped Johnny and did not like Dove, but he and Dove were bound together by the common servitude to Johnny's eritocratic rule. Half a Dusty... Half of Dusty sympathized with one boy, half of them with the other in this quarrel. It seemed to him that everybody liked Johnny. Old Mr. Latham because he was so clever at his work. Mrs. Latham because he was reliable. The four Latham girls because he sensed them so and then grinned. Most of the boys in the other shops around, around Hancock's Wharf liked Johnny, though some of them fought him on sight. Only Dove hated him. Sometimes he would get Dusty in a corner, tell him in a hoarse whisper how he was going to get a pair of scissors and cut out Johnny Tremaine's heart. But he never dared do more than trip him, and then whine out of it. Some day, said Johnny, and his good nature restored. I'll kill you, Dove. In the meantime, you have your uses. You get out the buckets and run the north stair and fetch back drinking water. The Lathams were on the edge of the sea. Their well was brackish. Look here, Mrs. Latham said Dusty was to go and... Get along with you. Don't you go arguing with me. Fetching water, sweeping, helping in the kitchen, tending the annealing furnace in the shop were the unskilled work the boys did. Already, Johnny was so useful at the bench he could never be spared for such labor. It was over a year since he had carried charcoal or a bucket of water, touched the broom, or helped Mrs. Slayton brew ale. His ability made him semi-sacred. He knew his power, and he reveled in it. He could have easily made friends with stupid Dove, for Dove was lonely and admired Johnny as well as envied him. Johnny preferred to bully him. Johnny, followed by his subdued slaves, slipped down the slatter with an easy pop. To his left was Mr. Latham's bedroom. The door was closed. Old Master did not go to work these days until after breakfast. Starting the boys off, getting things going, he left this to the bustling daughter-in-law. Johnny knew the old man whom he liked, and was already up and dressed. He took this time every day to read the Bible. To his right, the only other bedroom was open. It was here Mrs. Latham slept with her four poor fatherless girls, as she called them. The two biggest and most capable were already in the kitchen helping their mother. Celia was sitting on the edge of one of the unmade beds, brushing Ms. Anna's hair. It was wonderful hair seemingly spun out of gold. It was the most wonderful thing in the whole house. Gently, Celia brushed and brushed, her little oddly shaped face turned away, pretending she did not know that Johnny was there. He knew neither Celia nor Azana would politely wish him the conventional, Good morning! He was lingering for his morning moment so. Celia had never lifted her eyes as she put down her brush and very deliberately picked up a hair ribbon. The Lathams couldn't afford such luxuries, but somehow Celia always managed to keep her little sister in hair ribbons. Very carefully, she began to tie the child's halo of pure curls. She spoke to Azana in so low a voice it was almost a whisper. There goes that wonderful Johnny Tremaine. Azana took her cue, already so excited she was jumping up and down. Johnny worth his weight in gold Tremaine! If you don't think he's wonderful, ask him, Mazana. Oh, just how wonderful are you, Johnny? Johnny said nothing, stood there and grinned. The two youngest Lathams were already always insulting him, not only about how smart he was, but how smart he thought he was. He didn't care. Every now and then they would say something that irritated him, and then together they would shout, Johnny's mad! As an apprentice, he was little more than a slave until he had served his master seven years. He had no wages. The very clothes upon his back belonged to his master, but he did not, as he himself said, take much. 
There were only four real rooms on the Latham house, the two bedrooms on the second floor, the kitchen and the workshop on the first. Johnny paused in the lower entry. In the kitchen, he could see his formidable mistress bent double over the hall. Madge, in time, would look like her mother, but at eighteen she was handsome in a coarse-grained, red-faced, thick-waisted way. Dorcas was sixteen and built like Madge, but not so loud voice, nor as roughly good-natured. Poor Dorcas thirsted for elegance. She would rub flour on her face, trying to look pale like the fashionable lady she saw on the street. She wore her clothes so tight, hoping to look at Dero. She looked apoplectic. How they all had laughed when she, her strays burst in the middle of meeting with a loud pop. She did not call her mother Ma, but Mother, or respected Mother, in her efforts to avoid the rough, easy speech of her associates on Hancock's wash. She talked, when she remembered it, in a painfully pressy, proper way. Johnny thought Madge pretty bad, and Dorcas even worse, but he was philosophical about them. He wouldn't mind having them for sisters. They certainly were good, hard workers, except when Dorcas tried too hard to be elegant. It had already been decided that when he grew up to be a really great silversmith, as Mr. Latham said he would, he was to marry Celia, and together they would inherit Grandpa's silver business. Celia was just his age. This idea seemed only mildly offensive to both of them. Johnny had no particular objections. Smart apprentices were always getting ahead by marrying into their master's families. He had been flattered when Mrs. Latham had told him that he might marry one of her girls. Of course, imagine Dorcas, they were fine, big, buxom girls, would make better wives. But didn't he think they were a little old for him? True. Celia was just a mite spindly, but she was coming along fine. Zana was so weakly it didn't seem worth making any plans for her maturity. So it was to be Celia. Johnny had often heard Mrs. Latham say that Azana was hardly worth the bother she was to raise. The little girl, her beautiful brown eyes wide with interest, never seemed to mind these remarks of her mother. But they made Celia cry. Celia loved Azana. She was proud when people stopped her on the street and said, is that little angel your sister? She did not mind that there were so many things Azana could not keep down, like pork gravy, mince pies, new beer. If Azana got wet, she had a cold. If a cold, a fever. First Johnny, with a customary look shop, got the sulky dove in his buckets headed from North Square. Then he took the key to the shop out of his pocket as though he owned it. Dusty, good and quiet as a mouse, followed him. Look sharp, Dusty, Johnny said. Get the annealing furnace going. Get to the coal house. Fetch in charcoal. You'll have to do it yourself. I want to get this buckle mended before breakfast. Already the day's bustle had begun up and down the wharf. A man was crying fish. Sailors were heave hoeing at the roads. A woman was yelling that her son had fallen into the water. Parrot said distinctly, King Hancock! Johnny could smell the hemp and spices, tar and salt water, the sun-drying fish. He liked his wolf. He sat at his, at his own bench before him the innumerable tools of his trade. The tools fitted into his strong, thin hands. His hands fitted the tools. Mr. Latham was always telling him to give God thanks, who had seen fit to make him so good an artisan, not to take it out and lording it over the other boys. That was one of the things Johnny did not let him bother much. Dove came back, his thick lower lip thrust out. The water had slopped over his breeches down his legs. Mrs. Latham does not want you in the kitchen? Johnny did not even look up from his buckle. Nah. Well then, this spoon you finished yesterday afternoon has to be melted down. Made over. You beat it to the wrong gauge. Did Mr. Latham send to us wrong? No, but it is. It is supposed to match this spoon. Look at it. Dove looked. There was no argument. So get out of crucible. As soon as Dusty's got the furnace going, you melt it down and try again. I'd like to get you in a crucible, thought Dove, and melt you down. I'd beat you to the proper gauge. Two years younger than me, and look at him. It was Uzana who ran in to tell that 
that Grandpa was in his chair and breakfast was on the table. The soft brown eyes combined oddly with the flying with fair hair. She did look rather like a little angel, Johnny thought, just as people were always telling Celia on the street, and so graceful. She seemed to float about rather than run. No one to see her would ever guess the number of things she couldn't keep down. 